All right, now bringing in the man himself, the author, the power, the fuel behind the beast, which is fueling all of our days and nights right now as we attempt to consume all of it. Uh, our guy Dane Brugler, what's up, Dane? Ah, uh, it's uh, <laughs> how many days we got? We're almost a week away. That's the draft cannot come here soon enough, but uh. Yeah, things are good. It, it, last week was fun being able to uh, release the beast to everybody and share it, and that was that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, it's a fun time of the year, right? When we're we're still in the process of figuring things out. Uh, but yeah, we're 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 getting close to time where it's actually time to draft, and that's even be more fun. It, it will. And uh, congratulations on the beast. It's incredible, as I've said a million times. I hope people are out there uh, subscribing and continue to get it with your athletic subscription. It's a great deal. As if the athletic wasn't giving you enough already, now you get this, which is probably worth double the price of it. So uh, everybody, make sure you have it. Let's start here, though. Bengals. You know, everybody knows where the probably priority number one, the draft is giving them all of these offensive tackles. They all are big. They're all fitting, you know, Trent Brown and uh, Orlando Brown. They say they might want to go by Brown County as their nicknames. The Bengals are not hiding what they're looking for, what their type is at tackle. For you, sort through that those guys, those tackles that are in that mix around 18 with that lens of – you know, the bigger, the better for these guys. It's it's not as simple as just putting a weight and a height number, but mm -hmm. uh, it certainly helps you helps guide you with the Bengals at 18 potentially. Yeah. And I think it, there's a good chance we see four or five tackles um, gone uh, by the time we get to 18. Let's just hypothetical. Let's say, uh, you know, Joe Alt's gone. Olu Fashanu, JC Latham, uh, Talese Fuaga, uh, Fatanu from Washington. Let's say those five players are off the board in the first 17 picks, which I think is realistic. How do the Bengals feel about Amarius Mims and Tyler Guyton? That's to me, is one of the more interesting questions to ask uh, when you talk about these teams picking in the mid-rounds because both, I think, fit in terms of what this team could be looking for. But they need development. They need time. And so where what is the timeline? How do how do the Bengals see the timeline for for these two players? Because uh, you know, there's a good chance they might need them to contribute in year one. Uh, maybe not right away, but at some point injuries happen. Uh, you know, you need a, your first round pick to step in, give you snaps. So do they feel good about either one of Mims or Guyton being able to do that? Both guys, they talk about size. I Marius Mims is one of the most impressive 340 pounders. No, not even one of. He is the most impressive 340 pounder I've ever seen. Uh, you factor in 36 uh, over 36 inch, 36 inch arms, over 11 inch hands. Uh, the guy is just a freak, and you just have to reconcile the lack of starts, only eight, the lack of career snaps played, some of the injury things, and the fact that he will need some time because of that lack of experience. But I think it's important to differentiate the lack of experience from the just being a raw player. He is more inexperienced than he is raw. And that's, that's important. But how do the Bengals see these two guys? Cause Guyton does need uh, more development as well. So if uh, they get to a spot or if they get to the 18th pick and uh, those two guys are the tackles left on the board, I, this is the type of thing they're probably going through right now as they work through, uh, you know, the, the month of April is all about building the draft board and not, not even building it, but finalizing it. Uh, you know, they've had a lot of draft discussions up to this point. You have to have these discussions because that's what it could come down to on draft day. Where, um, you know, where do you view, you know, you mentioned Waga, upon you. Uh, guard tackle is the league split on this but where do you think that the fit is best for those two guys in particular as far as inside outside fuaga i think is a right tackle i think that's where he probably projects best that's where he played in college that's where he's most comfortable i think he could kick inside and be a, a really good guard um, but I do think his best fit is probably outside at right tackle, even if he doesn't have that elite range, lateral range. Um, I, I think that he is he's such a good run blocker, and he does really nice job in pass protection. So right tackle is where I think he is best suited to play. 
Faitanu, I he has legitimate five position versatility. He really does. And I think aesthetically he looks like a guard, he plays like a guard, but he has the feet and the length to stay outside and play tackle. Now, we've seen him uh play uh, a couple different positions, but we've never seen him play on the right side. He played left tackle, he played left guard. Uh, so it's a projection. If we're going to talk about him as a right tackle, if we're going to talk about him center guard uh, on the right side, th- that's going to be a projection. But I think it's he's one of those guys that really has like a universal approval rating across the league. Uh, yeah. Everyone loves, not loves, but at least likes Fautanu. And yeah, he, he's really well liked from, from team to team. They just have different opinions about what exact position should be moving forward. You know, there's obviously still obviously playing different different directions they could go in round one mm-hmm. it, they're still going to need to tackle they're still going to need a swing tackle um if, if they don't take one there what do you what how deep is the drop how significant is the tier between 18 and let's say 49 where they would be again going back into that tackle market i mean how drastic is that I do think it drops off quite a bit, and I, I, you run you run the risk of just losing out on your options because offensive tackle because it does fall off, and we know a lot of teams need offensive tackle help. There's a good chance those guys get snatched up earlier than you're comfortable taking them. And I'm working on my seven rounder right now, uh, seven round mock draft, and it comes out uh, this week on the Athletic. And I struggled with offensive tackle for the Bengals. I had them going defensive line round one, and then in round two, it just offensive tackles didn't really line up there. Uh, so I went with a guard, and then uh, you know later on, it just it, it, so we're uh, keep kicking the can. And by the time you get to tackle, it's like okay, well this guy's more of a backup and if we're lucky he can be a swing guy and so uh, tackle is a a position where it's top heavy we're gonna see these guys fly off the board early and then it does fall off pretty quickly and you know even the guys in that day two range your Patrick Pauls your uh Roger Rosengarden um Kingsley Sua Matia um you know there's talented guys Blake Fisher from Notre Dame there's some talented players there but there's not a lot of them, and I think they're going to go probably earlier than you expect or all of us expect uh, and the Bengals expect just because if you don't have your guy, you can't wait and let him fall to you because that's just not how it works at the offensive tackle position. Um, I, I want to dive a little bit into some of the depth on the offensive line with you too. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how many centers there, there might be even in this draft that could that can be starters in this league. What what have you made about some of the interior offensive line options as you get into later rounds, which feels like it will be an area where the Bengals will be looking is is going to be in like that round two or three, maybe early mm-hmm. four, looking for uh potential center of the future uh, a, a sixth guy off you know on the line there that can play guard and, and center where, where do you see that and and is it as deep as maybe we've we've heard some in your in your eyes I think so. I think this is a, a year where if you need that interior line depth, there's uh, the tackles are going to get the most of the love, uh, and, and those guys are going to come off the board early in the first round. But the depth is on the interior of the offensive line. Uh, you know, you, at center, you got guys like Tanner Bordellini from Wisconsin or Bo Limmer from Arkansas. Those guys are kind of in that th- third, fourth round range. Um, I, I think an, an interesting name for Bengals fans might be uh, Cooper Beebe at Kansas State. Uh, who played tackle, played guard mostly in college, but I think he's he practiced at center. I think he could be a really good center in this league. So Cooper Beebe is, could be in that mix in the second round uh, in, in that range. So, yeah, this is a draft where interior offensive line – they're not going to get it's not the star power of the tackles because those guys are going to be first rounders but there's better depth rounds two rounds three rounds four both guard and center and a lot of interchangeable guys that have played both spots give you depth at multiple positions this is a really good year for that and so i think it's going to be one of those positions a lot of teams are looking for uh in rounds two through four we have spent a ton of time here lately talking about the receivers and the depth there. So I'm not going to go, we're going to, we're going to live in the trenches with you because I feel like I've exhausted the receiver conversation. Uh, and it's going to be a fun one to see where that lands with the Bengals, but on the defensive line side, uh, they need more ace. Hey, somebody's got to stop the run, right? They lost DJ reader. They didn't really replace it. This is not a great draft for that. And it got no. even worse with the Tavondre sweat thing that just recently happened, which pushed him even further down boards. 
where is run stopping defensive tackle in this draft? Does it even really exist, Dane? If you're looking for that true nose tackle, you're going to be disappointed uh, by what this draft has to offer. But I tell you what, I'm I'm a fan of the Bengals potentially uh, doing the double dip and uh, with the Longhorns and reuniting a, a Byron Murphy and a Tavondre Sweat. Uh, Murphy is obviously a first round pick. Tavondre Sweat could go at any point on day three, and I wouldn't be surprised. So, but I think you know you you, you pair those guys back up, and uh, I, I think you might have something. Because uh, I, I one thing you love about Murphy is he's equally disruptive versus the pass as he is against the run, and you can throw on the tape of him lining up in the a gap lining up as a, as a nose, a shaded nose, or, you know, he can play in the B gap. He, he, he can line up all over the interior. And so that versatility, that that's key. And the fact that he can stop the run, even though he doesn't have maybe the ideal body type you're looking for being just around six, one around 300 pounds, he uses his natural leverage so well. And he has uh twitch through his hips, through his body, a lot of power. Uh, his hands are very active and he's an explosive athlete. So all, all these things put together and he's a disruptive presence and I really like that fit for the Bengals at pick 18 because of that versatility because of the different ways he can win and the ways he can fit this defensive line pretty quickly as a rookie yeah from the franchise that brought you Geno Atkins not going to be scared away That's by right. the disruptive undersized defensive tackle they know what that looks like and to and and to be okay with embracing that um the the other thing is you know, what what do you what do you see in the depth there if, if you do end up in eighty at ninety seven early in the fourth and they still haven't taken defensive tackle what are some of the names that could pop there uh, that could be maybe good value or is there a point where you see a pretty significant cliff that's going to happen at that position. I, I do like the defensive tackle class on day two. I, I think there's some some quality depth pieces in this draft that are are going to be starters in the league. And even if it's not immediate, guys that can be uh, NFL-level starters. I think you, you look at Chris Jenkins from Michigan, not the same type of player as his dad. He's about 40 pounds lighter. He plays a, a kind of a different style uh, of football, but he's a really good athlete. He can uh, stop the run. Um, you know, he's really good gap control. So Chris Jenkins... Uh, um, he, he's someone that if he makes it to them in the second round would make sense. Mike Hall from Ohio State, uh, a flash player. So if you grade to the flashes, you're looking at this guy as one of the more disruptive uh, that you can find on day two. Young player, still just 20 years old, still learning, uh, doesn't have a ton of snaps. He's almost kind of like the Amarius Mims on defense because of the different body types. They, they look very different. But in terms of the lack of just total snaps played, it's, it's, it's a little underwhelming. But when you look at the talent and how disruptive he can be with more volume, then I I think you can talk yourself into that pretty easily. Uh, Mason Smith, LSU defensive tackle, 6'5", 300 pounds. That's what you're looking for. That's what you want guys to look like. Uh, and I think that'll help him in a draft where there's not a lot of those guys. Uh, Braden Fisk from Florida State, Brandon Dorless, Oregon. So day two, uh, there's quite a few guys that I think could fit this Bengals team if they're looking for more defensive line depth. One last one. Uh, I'll, I'll allow you to, you know, the Bengals have gone heavy lean, Every team does, but they have really focused on, hey, love ball, good character guys, all juice team. Like that is, they seek it. Who is the most love ball day two guy that you can think of that just football is his life and you're kind of betting on that uh, as you go through? Because so much of your exhaustive work is so good at pinpointing those traits and players. What? Who's maybe who's the most love ball guy that you see succeeding for that reason? That's maybe a day two or early day three. Um, I, you know, I, Mike Mikey Sanders still from Michigan, the defensive back. I mean, those coaches just they they won't stop talking about him and and what he means as a leader to that defense. Uh, I mean, he's a pure nickel and undersized, yet he'll still probably go in the second round, top fifty pick because he is exactly what you just said he is all football all the time and the character the leadership is is off the charts uh he would qualify uh javon bullard from georgia uh the coaches rave about him another undersized kind of a nickel type of player he uh would make sense for he kind of checks a lot of those boxes uh with the the personal character the football character uh that makes sense um I'm looking through my list here who else would make or would fall under that category uh those two guys for sure 
Uh, Peyton Wilson from NC State linebacker, he would be in that mix as well. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of those guys that if you're you know, there's a certain point where you feel comfortable taking the character risk, right? You know, there's a certain point where like Tavondre Sweat uh, at a certain point in the, on day three he might be worth it, uh, especially if you feel like you have the coaching in place, the locker room in place with the veterans that, you know, they can take them under their wing. Like you feel comfortable with that. Uh, but with a lot of these character guys, the high, high character guys, you move them up a little bit. Sometimes when, you know, the, t- the tape grade is the same, that's the differentiating factor that moves them just ahead of the other guy it is when the coaches don't stop talking about them. The, the captain uh, being a team captain, being a team leader, a guy that you're bringing into your locker room, your, your ecosystem uh, within your franchise. That's something that plays a big part. And so, you know, I think people maybe roll their eyes at time, uh, roll their eyes at times when you know, we start talking about that part of it, the intangibles NFL teams, that's how they will make that, that they will determine who they draft. And so it certainly makes sense to talk more about it. There is no doubt. And we certainly know it makes more sense to talk about it here. I don't have to see enough draft lists where at the end of it, it says captain, 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 all the way down the Bengals list. Uh, it matters. And it certainly yeah. matters here. And it has helped them create the culture that they feel like has helped them win a lot of games uh, that and, you know, Joe Burrow. So uh, all, all those helps. things go together. Dane, incredible work as always. Thank you for taking the time to join us and uh, get your naps in. You deserve them. Anytime. Thanks, Paul. Thanks.